Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Instantly Informed. Um, today I am joined by a fantastic panel um, where we will be discussing uh, cybersecurity visibility. So today we're looking at how to um, identify the gaps within your cybersecurity posture um, and also the ways that you can um, look to plug those gaps as well. So um, I'm Louise, I am the marketing coordinator here at CyberClan. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to CyberClan and who we are. Um, so we are based across the United States, um, Canada and the United Kingdom. We offer a range of managed security services, as well as risk management and instant response services. Now, as we're based across these three regions, we offer these globally, um, helping to make sure that your security posture is nice and strong, but also helping to offer remediation efforts in case you are a victim of cyber attack. So I will now introduce you to our wonderful panellists. Today I am joined by Larry Whiteside, who is our CTO here at CyberClan, and O'Shea Bowens, who is the founder and CEO of Null Hat Security. So welcome, everyone. How are you? Larry, wonderful. Like, it's Thursday. <laughs> Fantastic. Larry, if you'd like to Let's give go. yourself a little bit of more of an intro. Sure, sure. So uh, Larry Whiteside Jr., uh, I am the CTO and CSO of CyberClan. Uh, I've got responsibility for our technology strategy and securing the organization as a whole, right, uh, both internally and externally. Um, I'm also responsible for our customer-facing um, execution of our services. So I engage a lot with our customers to find out and understand what their security posture looks like and give them ideas and thoughts on how to make it better. Um, I come Today, right, I, I'm ooh, 29 years, I think, at this point of being in the field of cybersecurity. I'm a lot older than I look, is what I've been told. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been a C-level executive for global organizations for over 20 years. And I'm a former Air Force officer. So I bring a, uh, I've been doing this for quite some time. And I've watched this industry change considerably over uh, those 29 years I've been doing this. Fantastic. And O'Shea, it appears that you're on mute. Yep, yeah, got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning. Yeah, it, it happens to at least one person at one point. You know, <laughs> Definitely. So I'll be the victim. Uh, yeah, my name is O'Shea Bowens. Uh, I'm in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I'm the founder and CEO of Null Hat Security, uh, so mostly focusing on the things that I want that I like to do, which is why I, I formed the company. So, helping uh, clients in the areas of security analytics, cloud security, threat hunting, incident response, the fun stuff, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just solving those, so, helping solve some of those challenges uh, before it's too late. So, ideally, I, I like to tell you know clients it's best to call me beforehand, uh, but of course, I typically get the calls after breach. So. Uh, also a lot of breach response. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I just turned 38 actually. Uh, I've been in security pretty much my entire career. So almost 13 or 14 years, uh, typical background, got into you know security and kind of the CD world of hacking when I was like 13. Um, you know, do dumb things as a kid and you start to realize, you know, there's actually like effects to some of the dumb things you're doing. So <laughs> as I, when I was younger, I, I thought, you know, hey, how can I actually help people instead of, you know, hurting. Um, wow. And that led me down a path of, uh, uh, of, the, of a career in cybersecurity. So truly love, you know, what I do, uh, you know. And outside of this, you know, I do try to step away from the keyboard. So I run and, and uh, I, I snowboard a lot. So I'm super pumped that the winter is almost here because that means it's, you know, snowboarding <laughs> season. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, yeah, no, I wish I could say I was as active as that, <laughs> clearly. I'm, I'm active. But no snowboarding, right? I, I live in Florida, so I enjoy the sun. I ride motorcycles, right? I'm in the gym, right? That that type of stuff where you're taking advantage of uh, the weather. So um, yeah, and so the thing O'Shea didn't mention is is so O'Shea and I know each other for a while now because O'Shea is a member of my not-for-profit 
right? So I've got a not-for-profit that I'm the president and co-founder of that's geared at increasing diversity in cybersecurity. So loving this panel because it's one of the most diverse panels that I've participated on. And yes, and we've month, just so. been joined by our third panelist. Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm good. Sorry for the late join. My apologies. No worries. That's fine. If you'd like to just give us a brief intro to yourself, that would be fantastic. Sure. I'm Lynn Watson. I'm the Director of Compliance and Risk Management. I oversee, um, for Dinsmore and Scholl, I oversee um, our cybersecurity program um, and uh, manage the security team. Uh, Dinsmore is a large national law firm with about uh, 1,400 employees, um, 30 different um, locations. Fantastic. So, um, yes, anyway, welcome everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, as, as most of you already know, if you've attended one of our webinars before, we do um, host a question and answer session at the end. Um, which we would love you to um, participate in. So um, if you do have any questions that pop up throughout the webinar, we will try to answer them um, throughout the duration. However, um, we do like to try and cover them off at the end. Just click the Q&A button um, and ask away. So um, my first question, guys, is what's the best way to um, identify issues or gaps within your company cybersecurity posture. Um, so Lynn, from, from a company perspective, I know that um, that your your company in particular, you know, being within compliance as well, um, that that it falls within your role um, on the on the on your business side. Could you give us some insight into to how you would um, you know look to to find out those those gaps within your posture? So obviously, like most organizations, we do risk assessments every year. Um, we look at um, all of our tools and we look to do tuning. Um, and through those engagements with each one of our vendors, um, that those tuning sessions really um, can give us a lot of insight, as do the risk assessments, obviously. Um, you identify gaps there um, pretty easily. I say easily. Um, it's obviously a very complex thing. Um, but engaging with um, vendors to, to help you, you know, sometimes you're too close to the situation, right? It's, it's um, you know, like anything in life, and sometimes you need to take that step away, um, and those third-party providers really do a great job of helping you do just that. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me say, so, um, you know, as we talk about and we think about visibility, right, and, and identifying holes in our security posture, right? So uh, part of the topic here today is visibility. And I think one of the challenges that organizations have, and I'm interested in what both of you are seeing, is, is that as we move forward with this digital innovation trend that COVID sort of forced upon a number of organizations who weren't planning for it, right? You know, a lot of companies were happy with being on premise and happy with, you know, having their you know, 1990s data center set up, <laughs> just all this physical stuff. Um, but now once everybody moved home and everybody started having to rethink what day-to-day -day operations look like and, and what, what you know, okay, now everybody's home and now I've got to get more VPN licenses because we only had enough VPN licenses for the executive staff or, right, we only had burst licenses to go to X amount uh, in case of emergency, right? But so as we've done that, how, how are you, Lynn, in your organization, and for you, O'Shea, with the customers you're dealing with, what are you seeing that they're doing to reshape what visibility means, right? Because, you know, in the architectures of old that we've been, grown accustomed to uh, over our careers, visibility literally meant, okay, let me watch the perimeter of this thing. I'm not going to watch a lot of inside, but let me at least watch the perimeter of this thing we've set up, right? Which is why the firewall market has been so big for the last, you know, 30 years, which is why, you know, all of these different markets have been so big. But, but what, what are we seeing now? Yeah, I, so when I think visibility, this is, my answer is essentially twofold, right? So one, when I think visibility, the first thing that comes to mind is really uh, authentication, right? So as, like, like you mentioned, companies are expanding and companies have had to shift their business model into the remote workforce, how do you determine and how do you identify 
And how do you actually, from an audit, from an audit framework perspective, whatever audit framework you're with, how do you uh, keep solid records, right? And that can be drilled down to authentication, right? Are you using uh, like an Okta, right? To ensure that anybody that enters key applications critical to your business have some type of audit record uh, and at least one form of uh, security in front of that application to kind of deter attackers, right? So naturally we've all heard this has been beaten into our heads, but behind that authentication, there should be some form of multi-factor authentication, right? Or you're using some form of 2FA. And what I like to state is when you're building, when you're, when you're starting those building blocks for, for a security program, ensuring from a visibility perspective that not only do you know who's actually touching these things, you have a way to go back in time and determine that, right? The worst place to be from a, uh, from a post-breach uh, scenario is to be in a place where you have no records, right? You know what was touched. You know what was potentially dumped on the internet from attackers. Hopefully that doesn't happen to anyone here. But you, know, you understand this part of your uh, network has been uh, successfully ransomware. But then the second layer is, well, how do I go back in time to begin an investigation, right? And if you can't think to authentication and leveraging those records to help you move forward from a post-breach perspective, you're in a really, really tough spot, almost like an impossible spot to adequately respond to those threats. You can pay them off if you want. If you want, you know, we'll get into that part later, that, you know, that, that, that murky water. But if you don't have levels of authentication in place, from a uh, uh, from uh, from a you know security posture, that is a, a really horrible place to be. So think authentication, think MFA first, so creating that that kind of that outer shell around your key critical applications in your environment. And and once you have that moving into you know one of two areas around either threat assessment or uh, threat modeling, you know, the quick, just a quick one, you know, threat modeling, we hear about that more in the lines of application security, but threat modeling is really essentially the, the, the assessment and a security review of not only, you know, your, your, your application, but your networking, your systems, right? So painting that picture of where security issues or where security gaps may exist, uh, for, uh, may exist uh, against, you know, core parts of your business. So understanding that, after you know building out your authentication is I think that's a natural step when you're building out the security program and then thinking about a threat assessment that's you know that's a bit more pricey but that's really thinking about okay great we have we've performed threat modeling we understand where the holes are in our network we understand what our systems look like if we're in cloud we understand what instances we, what system what AMIs we're, or system images we're using from an EC2 perspective or ECS perspective but now let's think about okay what threat actors are, are relevant for us really relevant for us. If I'm in banking, what APT groups are relevant to the banking and financial sectors? If I'm in pharmaceuticals, what, what, are those, what do those threat actors look like and what TTPs do they use or Texas techniques and procedures? So what does that look like? And then beginning to shape your defenses around that. Don't be too broad. Try to be specific with known actors and known malware and known ransomware and looking to identify how you can defend yourself against that. So, so I agree with a lot of stuff you're saying, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, access, right? If you don't have access, right, you can't get to it, right? And, and being able to monitor and have access controls around all of your critical systems and the data that they hold is important. But let's, and I, I hate to beat up on these guys because Target's in a much better shape today than they were, were before, right? Tony, the guy, the, the CISO over there, like they're doing amazing things and I love them and their entire team. They've got a great, amazing team. So Brenda, Tony, everybody, like, you're doing great. But if we go back to the breach that they did have, it was actually an authorized account that got into the HVAC system that, you know, ended up compromising their point of sale system because they didn't have proper segmentation internally. But had they had visibility into right so we can say let's say they had an entirely flat network but had they had visibility that hey an hvac system is performing these types of operations connecting into other parts of the network hey maybe they would have been able to respond to it now we do know that they were giving alerts from the monitoring that they had and nobody's responding to them but right right so when we talk about visibility Right. What, what are we doing? Right. Because if you think about the transition that's happening in this digital transformation era. 
right? Amazon and, and Azure and GCP aren't getting bigger because they just want to throw more, make the cloud bigger. They're getting bigger because more customers are going to them, right? Especially small and medium-sized businesses who it just makes more sense fiscally for them to not now have a server sitting in their closet because we actually had a customer <laughs> who, who literally every day at three o'clock their server would go down and they didn't understand why, right? And they were calling and they were uh, every day at three o'clock, they're like, you know, our server's down again, what's going on? And we're like, we don't know, what do you mean? Come to find out it was the maid, the, 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 the people cleaning the office that would come in, needed to plug up a vacuum. And so they would just unplug this thing Right, they didn't know that it was actually connected to a server. They just saw a plug in the, in the wall, and they would unplug it, plug the vacuum up, do their vacuum in, and then plug the server back up. Right. So, but but to, to my point there, right. So when you start talking about operational security and this digital transformation, where people are starting to say, "Hey, I'm moving infrastructure to the cloud. I'm I'm moving services to Azure. I've got you know I'm standing up these virtual environments in in these cloud-based uh, infrastructures." But now those same third parties, right, that we had when we were on-prem are now connecting into those environments as well. And they're authorized, right? But you don't know what level of security they have inside their third-party environment. You don't know, are they doing phishing uh, uh, tests against their users? Are their users to, smart enough to not give their credentials away, right? And so, so one of them gets popped in a third party. Now these authenticated, authorized credentials are now in the hands of somebody who shouldn't have access to your environment and they're connecting in. How are you, how, what are we doing, right, as an industry to get, sorry, to get um, more visibility into these environments where we just haven't had it historically, right? AWS has been a blind spot to many people. APIs are popping up all over the place to allow interconnectivity into third-party apps that you're working with. So how do, we, how do we solve this problem and help organizations ensure they've got the visibility across their entire ecosystem, both internally for those who still have, you know, core infrastructure physically, and then for those who are now moving to the cloud and, and need it there, but aren't really thinking about it because they're just saying, they're looking at it almost like you look at an iPad. Oh, it's just an app, click. Now I've got this, this new app and my team can now access this new app. But look, we really have no visibility into how people are interacting in it. And it's very challenging. I'll, I'll let Lynn take the first shot. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I would agree that, that you raised, Larry, a host of, of <laughs> issues, right? And, and my dog is very excited about it as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, it is a really challenging situation. I mean, it's very exciting, right? All the capabilities that, that all of our networks have um, and all of the connectivity that we can have, but it, it inter introduces uh, a myriad of, of issues. And, and I, you raised a couple of different ones here that I wanted to, to talk about. First one being just this uh, wide, wide array of third party, um, third party vendors, right? Um, and making sure that you understand what their purpose is um, and what the scope is and not just having a blanket exception for connecting with you and really trying to scope it appropriately. So that takes a lot of engagement with your internal people so that they understand that they have to be very specific about what the vendors are doing and about what the intent is so that you can make sure that their access and their credentials and their, their, their abilities to connect in where and what they're doing is appropriate. So that when you are, in our case, we have an MSSP, that they can be aware of what activity they should be seeing and understand their normal, right? Um, that was exactly what I was about to, uh, what I was thinking was, is this the case where, you know, if you're, if you're interacting with all of these individual service providers, not only are you, are you adding all these extra layers without necessarily um, being able to fully configure everything properly, still leaving the gaps in your network, but having a really good like EDR endpoint detection system in place doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to work for you unless you've got someone monitoring it. So in, some, in that sort of case, having a, a managed security services provider in place, that also helps to reduce the cost and and add that extra level of security, doesn't it? Right, absolutely. 
And the other thing that I think is worthwhile noting, you know, we talk about all of the technology and, and those are obviously critically important, but the people are so important. And helping um, our users who have the relationship with these vendors understand the need. Because in the past, they are just, you know, years ago, I need an account, great, here's an account, and, and that was that was it. Now we're asking more specific questions. We need to know what exactly they're doing. We need to know, um, and, and we had a lot of pu pushback. Um, like, why do you need to know that? And you know, this is a lot, this is time consuming. This is to have the discussions with them about why we're asking more drill down questions and why we need more information for them so that we're not spinning our wheels and tracking down false alerts. No, these are accounts that are supposed to be behaving this way. Um, but we need to collect that information at the outset. And so um, communication and education, you know, not just with our general end users, but with the administrators and those, the own pe our own people in our own IT department sometimes is just really necessary and, and um, ultimately kind of smooth that pathway so that you are setting up accounts appropriately and that we are fully informed on the security side about what we should expect to see from a particular account. And so, uh, yeah, and that was, a, I think I agree with, with, you know, pretty much everything Lynn said. And, and going back to not only Larry's question, but that exact situation, right? So with Target, uh, as an example, you know, did they have, you know, the investment for a security program? Yes. Did they have resources and staff and the technologies? Yes. Did they have process and procedures in place? Yes. Uh, the and, and many companies find themselves in this situation where they've made that initial investment. They've taken time to build out the program and bring in the human talent. Um, but when, one of the gaps that you see that seems to present itself kind of over and over from you know, many of the breaches is really the, the understanding of the data that's in-house and really where that data exists. So let's go back to Target, for example. With Target, they, uh, they have the technologies in place, but did they have a baselining and profiling of those systems? So what I mean by that is, was there a technology in place, let's say, uh, you know, not to name any specific vendors, but was there some type of solution in place from an EDR or SIM perspective that allowed them to essentially profile and tag uh, the information within their environment? So by tagging, I mean, well, we know that we have a, let's say we process credit cards within our business, uh, we know that this segment of the network is responsible for processing credit cards, and we have run essentially profiling or baselining on those systems, meaning that this type of data is, uh, is flowing back and forth, in and out, ingress and egress of this segment of the network. So is that data tagged so our SIM or a log correlator like a Splunk uh, uh, can readily identify that? And me as a human, could I type in PCI-1 and know that these are the log sets for this particular server that handles credit card data. What Target missed essentially was the individuals grabbing that data uh, and, and really just moving that to a plane. This, this kind of shows the craftiness there. All they did was really move uh, credit card numbers to a plain TXT record, right? And then exfil that TXT record over, over small, small beacons or packets. So instead of creating a large file, zipping that together, and that's like six or seven gigs, leaving the network, they took that six or seven gig TXT file, did not uh, unzip it or encode it, and then broke it out and then sent it out in very, very small increments over the network. And that traffic, if you, if you, if you don't have essentially a way to identify the credit card numbers, a lot of e EDRs or SIMs will, without going deep in the weeds, a lot of EDRs and SIMs will allow you to build out custom signatures where you can actually search for uh, credit, card, uh, credit card numbers and from a fixed length perspective, credit card right. numbers typically have a fixed length. So using some type of regex, you could write a signature that says, hey, if you see a 12 digit number leaving the environment, create some type of alert. And they did this in plain text. And because it was very small increments, they blended into the network traffic. So they beaconed out and beaconed out and beaconed out over days and days and days. These credit card numbers uh, blended into the traffic, but there wasn't necessarily a rule in place that uh, was actually searching for credit card numbers in plain text, right? So right. that's something that, that, that they likely would have caught 
had they had that level of, of alerting in place. And this isn't to fault them. I'm sure they're not the only ones even today in 2021 that don't have those type of rules in place. But this is what I mean by tagging and identification of the data sources that you actually have in place. So you've taken those steps, those initial steps of building out the program. Now it's time to really, really dig deep with that human talent and think about what type of data do we have inside of our environment? Have we appropriately tagged and correlated that data to understand if that data moves from system A to system B would we catch that? And that's where, you know, a lot of us actually sit even today, right? Really understanding what data is inside of our environment. Do we have a proper way to identify that data? And if we can identify that data shifting around our network, have we written out some type of uh, rule or signature or worked with our, uh, our solution vendors to identify typical ways that attackers move uh, 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 the way the attackers actually con construct their attacks. When I mentioned threat profiling earlier, that's essentially what I mean. It's really understanding your vertical you operate within and uh, the threat actors that are operating within your vertical and targeting banks or, or pharmaceuticals and understanding how they operate. So yeah, no. with, with that in mind, would, you know, we, uh, part, part of my understanding bear in mind I'm marketing um, is to, um, part of my understanding is that you know by by being able to to map your network properly and and carry out a proper um, instant response plan and, and plan everything previous to to being hit hopefully um, although in a lot of cases sometimes the IR plan actually comes after it's happened um, does does this allow corporations to to essentially you know locate the gaps within the network and then look for those solutions to be able to to fill those um uh, like carrying out penetration testing vulnerability assessments and security reviews and so on is that something that even small businesses should be looking at, at doing and, and implementing to to help um identify those gaps that they might have so, so, I mean, those are all steps, right? Those are all little things that every company, right? Large or small can do, right? But it's, it's also having an understanding of the results coming out of those. And it's also understanding what exactly are you going to run a vulnerability assessment against? What are you going to run a penetration uh, test against? Which comes down to some basic things of knowing your environment, knowing your asset management, right? What do I have? Where is it located? How do I access it, right? Because a lot of organizations don't even have that basic understanding. They know that they're in AWS. They know that this is how they access it. They don't have a whole lot of details on how to run a vulnerability assessment against it or how to run a penetration test against it. They know that they've got infrastructure, right? They, they just, it, so it's starting in these little modular components of know what you have, right? then begin to run some assessment of some sort against what you have to identify vulnerabilities, identify gaps, identify risk, and then begin to prioritize them based on risk to begin to address them. Which is the one that's going to impact your business the most? Which is the, right, and, and start processing it down. But so few organizations really understand how to quantify those things and put those things together, right? So, so Lynn, you, you being in the governance risk compliance space, right, that's, and sort of your world, right, of, of, of governance and risk and compliance and documenting, what would you tell to companies who are on this journey of trying to, you know, identify risk and capture and prioritize them? So, uh, Larry, I agree with everything you said. I think, um, I think understanding your organization and where, you know, to use the phrase that everybody used, where are your crown jewels? It's going to look very different for me than it may look for O'Shea that it may look for anybody else on the call, right? So you, you really need to know your organization and you need to spend the time doing that, um, having those discussions. What do they care most about and prioritizing that and identifying where's the risk? Um, it does not, you know, and I think, um, Larry, you talked about it before, maybe it was O'Shea, where you said you, you don't want to approach it just with a blanket and do it, you know, kind of generically, right? You want it, it needs to be tailored for your organization um, and so making sure that you're targeting it appropriately, everybody should be doing those, absolutely, without question. This is kind of one of those core um, competencies. But you need to also be prepared to make it actionable. So you're going to get a lot of information at the end of this assessment, right? You have to be prepared and understand that 
Um, if you get back some critical vulnerabilities, you can't sit on that. <laughs> it's, I would prefer not to do the vulnerability assessment and not see the critical vulnerabilities than have it come forward and have 10 or 12 and, and a bunch of highs and be like, there's really nothing we can do right now. You need to start action on it. You need to put together a plan. I know you don't necessarily have to tackle every single one, but you need to have an idea about how you would go about doing that. And you really need to stay engaged with the, the infrastructure side of your, um, of your organization um, and have some um, good relationships with them because sometimes you come back with this information and they get very defensive, right? Um, it needs to be a partnership. It needs to be a collaboration and they need to be committed to working with you to ensure that those patches are, are updated or new versions are put in place, that you are um, structured appropriately um, and they need to see this as, as you, you are helping and you guys are collaborating to make sure you are protecting the business. And when you, and, and when you kind of think about this, right, you know, we, we all hear people process and technologies, but I think one of those areas that we, that, you know, if I had to, I guess if I had to rank it, right, you know, people process technology, we go technologies with the spin, people attached to that spin, actually identifying the talent. We all hear about the shortage uh, uh, of, of cybersecurity talent that's out there. But the processing part, right? Like, you know, it's not to, not to hurt anyone's feelings, not to hurt Lynn's feelings, but, you know, most people, you know, frown when they hear compliance, right? Like no one wants to deal with compliance. <laughs> no one really wants to do, deal with GRC. But with the amount of focus that I think most of us and most companies, I mean, actually uh, apply to the technology aspect, I think you have to apply that. And I think, I believe you have to apply that to the processes and policies perspective, right? So there's no, it's no, it doesn't do you any good to invest, you know, boatloads of money in all your SIMs and EDRs and incident response and digital forensics tools if you don't really have a proper, a proper repeatable and uh, a, a repeatable, uh, repeatable process or policy in which to deploy that, in which to respond adequately to those threats, right? So understanding what your policies look like and taking that time to kind of war game or essentially have uh, training-based scenarios in which you're you know, mimicking and responding to uh, specific threat scenarios are key, right? So you know, me as a technologist, you know, super, super nerdy, I, I purposely try to sit down with the individuals responsible for the GRC side and really want to ensure that, hey, this is what I'm thinking from uh, a SIM perspective or from a technology perspective. How does this fit in line with some of the policies we have around, let's just say, like our password complexity, uh, uh, data at rest, data in transit? How does this actually uh, uh, fit in line with some of the policies we have that our in-house counsel has agreed upon, right? Uh, something that I think a lot of us forget about is really the, the legal aspect of it. So roping in your in-house counsel, or if you're working with a consultancy company from a legal perspective, roping them in to ensure what you have in place from a policy and procedural perspective is, is, is honestly realistic, right? I think when you see these breaches that are occur from time to time, you know, by, by time and time, I mean weekly. <laughs> but when you see, when you have these breaches that occur and, you know, you hear back from the, the CISO, you know, months later, a year later, and uh, from a written report perspective, and you see the investment that they've made from a technology perspective, most of the time what's missing from there is really the process and procedural perspective, right? Like, did we have something that was updated in which how we, should, how we respond to threats? Did we have something that was updated in relative to, uh, to how we build out systems, how we actually uh, categorize and protect, quote unquote, sensitive data or those crown jewels that Lynn mentioned are critical assets, right? So ensuring that your technology is in step with your policies and procedure really brings together like the security program like as a whole and makes that much more comprehensive because when one's out of whack, you can't, you can't adequately respond to a threat. You can't adequately deploy systems. Well, you can deploy those systems, but again, it's out of whack with what you actually have for your policy and procedure perspective. So ensuring that those two are linked uh, and, and, and really uh, coherent is just as important as, again, going out, spending the money on the, the tools and technologies or spending the money to bring in the human capital. So O'Shea, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. And, and thank you very much. Nobody likes compliance, you're right. <laughs> 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 but um, I, I think you raised an issue that, that people kind of um, shun a little bit sometimes, which is policy and procedure, documenting what it is that you should be doing. Um, and I think people just think, well, that's a checking the box, right? Like, like, okay, we need to do that. And so it kind of 
gets a nod, but that seems to be it. But that really is what connects what it is that we do to the technology that we have. And I think everybody thinks, well, I mean, I know what to do. If something were to happen, I know what to do. Well, that's fine. You may not be available. And so document your stuff, right? Get your, get your things documented, cross train, make sure people know where that is, exercise it, communicate about it, sit down. These, those are all really important things. And I think that that gets overlooked more often um, than I would than I would like. But of course, that's the compliance part of me coming out. I mean, it, it, write it down, write it down, and share it. Make sure that people know where it is and, and how to do it. That's all you need to say, like your chief compliance or CTO being off on holiday, um, <laughs> just yeah. as it all goes down. Well, the reality is, the bad guys pick holidays to to execute their stuff, right? And so, yeah, we're not coming Most on a Friday, don't we, Larry? <laughs> We're all on vacation. We're all with our families. They're not going to do it at two o'clock on a Tuesday. It is, so, um, it is it's, statistically been shown that the holiday season, specifically mid-December to mid-January, is some of the busiest time for threat actors. It, it's just the reality. They recognize that most organizations um, are literally, um, you know, taking off short staff and everything because they're focused on family and work-life balance during that time. So they ramp up and then they take their time. We saw it this year where literally the number of attacks went down considerably in late January and, and early to mid February because okay. then the attackers took their vacation because it was <laughs> after <laughs> most of the yep. rest of the world took theirs, right? Yeah, they've made um, their so, money so they that's the go thing. away now. <laughs> yeah. But but it's funny, Lynn, you you brought up the whole documentation point, right? And and the thing is, it is always the first thing left off. The documentation yeah. is the we're we're moving and we'll get to that. That we're moving, takes time. Yeah. We're growing. Yes. We'll get to that, right? It's it's all of those things that tend to get pushed to the side. And then what happens is you grow to a point and, and you come in and you have a risk assessment done and they immediately say, or you have some new regulation that begins to impact you because you've grown your business to a certain point. And you're like, and the first thing they say is, well, you haven't done the documentation. Your policies aren't aligned. You don't have procedures. You don't have SOPs. You don't have, and you're like, well, yeah, yeah, we, we know we're, we were going to get to that. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like you, you need that now. Like you, you needed that yesterday. So that let, let, let's go. And then you scramble trying to do that. And then people wonder, well, why, why does it take my new staff that I bring on board so long to get up to speed operationally? Because you've got no documentation. Right? Right. <laughs> they don't understand what the hell they're supposed to do. So for the right. first month or two, they're literally watching other people and doing things that, that's just taking them more time to get up to speed, where if you had focused on getting all the documentation done up front, getting your procedures aligned, getting your policies out there, all of those things would make your onboarding and ramp up time for staff more short, uh, much shorter, thus making you more efficient, which is what you want to be ultimately anyway. So, right. yeah. and, and, that's and, also, all, and, and that's it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Liz. I, I was also going to say, do it, get it done, right? It, whenever it is, even if you've not done it yet, take the time to do it now, but take the time every year to review it. Set aside time. Everybody re reviews their, in my circumstance, I review them for everybody make the edits, send them out, ask them to review it, and they come back. But everybody can take their pieces, make the edits. But you need to set a time, you need to send it out, and you need to collect it. It needs to be current. It does not going to do anybody any good if you prepared it in 2015, and here we are in 2021. And we don't even have that system anymore. We don't even have that role anymore. Somebody goes to look at it and goes, this doesn't even make sense. So Anyhow, go ahead, O'Shea. No, what I wanted to say was, all, like, well, I think Larry nailed that in regards to that scramble <laughs> aspect of it, because the reflective side of the, the, the other side of, of the scramble aspect of creating that documentation, especially around onboarding, and I think this is probably just as dangerous as having, you know, misconfigured technology or just have, having gaps in the technology space in, in, in general, is is really the documentation being poorly put together for onboarding. And now you have someone that spent, you know, 60 or 90 days basically le learning how to do it wrong, right? Because they're forced to follow someone else uh, who who's either A, not following your onboarding policy, so they're doing their own thing. And this, and, and this individual who's brand new to your company that you've made the investment to is spending that time 
doing the opposite of what their job actually looks like, right? I've been in this situation before when I was younger where I followed someone uh, and then, you know, I, I remember specifically I was working on, I was responding to some threats and I, and I documented it in a certain fashion. And the manager asked like, well, why did you do it that way? Like, like what is this? And, and I'm confused, you know, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, this is the way, I won't say his name, but this is the way this individual showed me how to do it. And he's like, no, that's off. Why did he show you that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, you told me to shadow him. I shadowed him. This is what he showed me. So this is what I did. So it, it, ensuring that th that that type of documentation that that really in, uh, that uh, intertwines with the human capital part is that onboarding is, is 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 a critical time as you're introducing the company to the individual. The individual's taking the time to learn about the way the company actually works and how to actually perform their jobs. If that's screwed up from the start. Again, horrible position to be in because that's what he's that's what he or she is going to know. And if you're a manager or a director or someone that's in leadership and you don't really under, and you don't know that the the documentation that you that your that your team is following is out of sync, you're going to be in a horrible position when it's time to speak to the rest of your uh, peers from a C level position or even from a board position in regards to someone asking, well, how did this happen? Well, this breach occurred because you missed this alert. Well, why did you miss this alert? Our analysts didn't understand and look there. Why didn't your analysts understand and look there? Because it's not documented, right? right. So that is super circular, <laughs> and and, and it, it can it can end up in a nightmarish situation. Well, but you just described the people process technology right yeah. there right. That, in that explanation, um, and that's why they're totally intertwined, and, and you really can't overlook one of them. Um, but people do, I think, tend to overlook the process and the documentation. Yeah, during like, our pre-discussion, we were saying that, um, our, well, I should mention that, you know, the number one uh, cause for entry into, uh, you know, networks was via phishing attack. Um, so, you know, from from an analyst point of view, obviously, the 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 process and 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 all of that documentation needs to be in place, but. Also, from a from like you know a lower echelons perspective, like Frank in accounting, making sure that he's not opening some dodgy email that's um, that looks like it's from the CEO asking to pay a certain amount of money, um, or you know granting access to um, to the ransomers in the first place by just clicking that random link <laughs> um, for the document that. That he thought had come from uh, his his director of finance, you know. Realistically, there's that whole human firewall perspective as well, isn't there? Within the people element of this discussion, and you know, so really training the the minions within the organisation as well is a key element in this, isn't it? Right. Yep. And uh, there was something. So yesterday when we were putting this all together, we mentioned, you know, what are the top ways ransomware gets introduced into the an environment, right? Yes, it's, it's phishing. I think we all know that. If you don't know that, now you do, right? Right. Uh, it's, it's, impo it's, it's impossible to be 100% uh, on blocking phishing attacks. Like, it's just humanly impossible. Uh, so go into this situation understanding that someone at some point is going to click on something. The challenge, I believe, is what happens after they click on this. So this comes down, this, this circles back to the technology aspect, right? Do you have some type of email filtering system in place that can help you with this? Do you have the appropriate uh, uh, applications in place in which you can actually analyze what's occurred on that user system? When, when it comes to phishing attacks, uh, most of the, the breach, response, breach response scenarios I've been involved with, you have a window. It is a small window, but you do have a window to uh, to essentially stop them at the head, right? So just because someone has clicked on a link and they've been maybe pushed to, uh, they've been sideloaded into another, uh, another, another website or they've actually downloaded an attachment and that EXE or that attachment executes and then releases the payload for or that binary that actually is ransomware. It still takes time for that to actually spread and propagate throughout the environment, right? So you have minutes to maybe you know, 15 to probably 30 minutes, I'd say, before that begins to actually replicate itself and then reach out to other users of, or if you're thinking about it from a MITRE perspective, before the initial access, I mean, after the initial access, uh, they begin to laterally move throughout your environment and execute another user's machine. So when we talk about wargaming and testing your technologies and your procedures, this is where it's super, super key, because within those 15 minutes, you can be 
a hero or kind of a zero. And I hate to put it as, as, bi <laughs> as binary as that, but you can be a hero and have your EDR in place in which you profiled your user system. So you understand that, hey, Larry and Larry and you know HR doesn't attempt to communicate with any service in the PCI zone, right? So why is Larry beaconing out? Why is there a power shift? Why, why is it me that clicked on that? Why is it me that clicked on that? <laughs> why did O'Shea? Frank, Frank and accounting. <laughs> why did O'Shea click on that link for World Cup tickets in Qatar, right? <laughs> so what, 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 in the time that that, that that binary executes or or something is actually spun up on that user's machine, if you profiled your EDR solutions to actually understand that, hey, this user doesn't typically run PowerShell, right? You don't see these type of, of, of scripts run on this user's machine. They don't typically communicate with this part of the network. Okay, now my analysts understand that that is something that's abnormal they can investigate up to the, the best of their abilities and begin to escalate up and you can essentially catch that activity before it actually does again laterally move and spread we know we know the playbook for most attackers now right this may shift next year but what is it it's the download it's the execution it's lateral movement it's uh and the lateral movement moving to exfiltration or if it's a ransomware attack it's a lateral movement trying to collect as many machines as they can and then the, the ransomware executing and locking, you know, locking those machines down. Now comes a ransom note, right? So if you can find yourself in a position where you can be a hero within those 15 minutes, that's where you ideally want to be. You want to stop that right. application. And it's not to say a zero means there's something wrong with you personally. It just means a zero is essentially, well, you weren't able to stop it. And now you're in a position where you're in negotiation with some dudes from the Ukraine around like how much money it's going to take to unlock systems in your network, right? So Playbooking these things, ensuring that you're actually running war game and scenarios. Again, ensuring your policies and procedure up to, or policies and procedures are reflective and and realistic to your capabilities. That's you know kind of key. And I know a lot of this sounds hard, but you're breaking these out into pieces over a year, over quarters, and as OKRs and as goals as you're building out your program, right? So it's hard, but not impossible, and it's a hell of a lot better than the alternative, right? One hundred percent. So we we've talked a lot about right. Um, uh, geez, we've covered a lot of different things, right? So we've talked about the cloud, and we've talked about you know um, uh, EDR, right? And just the steps and stages. We've talked about people, process technology. We've talked about authentication, right? So we've got about thirteen minutes left, and so. Uh, what I want to do is I want to give each of you uh, a, a chance to give. What's a takeaway you would give people, right? What's a takeaway? So people are on here listening today. They've got to go back to their company. They're trying to figure out, okay, where do I start, right? Where do I start? And 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 what are, what are the some basic one to three steps that I can take in my organization um, to be better tomorrow than I am today? Right. What are some what are those three things that each of you would share in your relative context of what you do? Right. Understanding O'Shea, you and uh, uh, you and Lynn are sort of in different areas of what we do in this cyberspace. Right. And I'm in another area. But from your perspective, I'd like us to share in our context. What are three things that you would give and explain on the, those and why those things are important? So. Um, O'Shea, I'll go with you first because you're going to be more on the technical side and then Lynn's going to come in, I know, from a different governance side of what that looks like. So go ahead. Something that, like my, my mom would said before she like passed away is, uh, it's a saying in the South, right? Closed mouths don't get fed. Essentially meaning if you're not asking questions, you don't know. So something I think has to be a part of you as a security professional, this goes down to that EQ versus IQ aspect, is really you know, do you understand your environment? And there's nothing wrong with saying no, right? It takes time to learn, big or small, the inner workings of your the entirety of your environment. So one is really asking questions, right? Don't be embarrassed to ask what you don't know. Do you understand how your systems are built? Do you understand the technologies are, that are in place, right? Two being, you know, jump in. When I say jump in, I mean, take time to, if, if it's, if let's just say it's cloud, if it's cloud and you don't fully understand a lot of inner workings of AWS, take the time to use many of the free resources that are out there to really learn about AWS, really learn about CICD pipelinings. Again, it's okay not to know this. Everybody's born ignorant to walking. You didn't come out of the womb walking right, uh, right off the bat. You got up, you fell, you crawled, eventually you learned. You know, there's nothing okay. Something I say is like, there's nothing wrong with temporary ignorance. 
It's just when you allow that to become long-term ignorance in our, in our field where you run into problems. So questions, diving in. And the third one is the communication with people outside of security. I think a lot of times individuals within our, our space tend to just focus on the security aspect. We don't tend to like reach out to other individuals and in other departments and ask what they work on from day to day. What upcoming projects do they have from day to day? Because from essentially at some point they're gonna look to security. Maybe that's three months from now. And then, you know, you're busy, you're working on whatever you have going on. And, you know, now you have to shift your focus to this project with the devs and you're looking to get through that as quick as possible because you have your own stuff going on. Uh, I think, you know, when you take that time to communicate with other teams, you essentially put yourself ahead of the curve because you know what's coming down the pipe with them in Q2, Q3, Q4, wherever you are currently. So, you know, essentially questions, ask questions, dive in and outward communication from the security team. All right, Lynn. Okay, so um, I'm glad O'Shea went first because I had time to, to process what he was saying and <laughs> up with my list of three. Um, I, I, would, I, I wanna start off by saying, you know, when I started in my role about six years ago, I would describe the, the program that we had in place to be um, burgeoning, right? It was an immature program six years ago. And so for anybody who is on this call who might feel that they're in that same place, um, I wanna share with you that the growth that we have experienced over those six years we are now ISO certified in, in um, 27001, so the security space. And um, you just ha you have to start somewhere. So I think about where we started and we prioritized training, um, started with training first. So I think that uh, making sure that you are running a kind of a comprehensive cybersecurity and privacy training for all of your employees um, and anybody who has any access to your data network um, once a year at minimum, and continue to feed them that information. Going back to what O'Shea said, is reaching outside of your organization and making sure you are communicating and, and creating those relationships. So training and um, kind of the socialization of security is, is absolutely critical. Um, and then second, I would say, again, um, take whatever it is you're doing now, even if you don't think it's full and complete and right and document it. So start with your policies and procedures, document where you are, with the goal to where you wanna to move to be. So building a security program and a posture of security is all about incremental changes. Document where you are now and continue to move those forward. Commit to reviewing them once a year, but get in when you make a change. You've got new technology, you've improved a process and make those changes as you make them. And then when you get to the end of the year, it's gonna be much less onerous to go in and, and do your full update to your policies. Those should be growing every year. I think this year we added three new policies and probably a dozen additional processes. And my goal every year is to continue to build that. And then the third thing I would say is um, be prepared. So, you know, everybody in this industry and, and some people get offended by it, but understand that it is not a question of if, but when, um, that there is going to be some sort of infiltration, some sort of breach, some sort of event and you need to know how you're going to resolve. Going back to O'Shea's, a zero or a hero, you know, the zero really is, in my mind, having no idea where to go and where to start. Even if you don't execute perfectly, even if there is a situation where you do end up having to negotiate for ransomware, knowing what, where you're going to move to and how you're going to respond is really, really critical. So one of the things I would encourage everybody to consider is document, even if it's you know, kind of a, a skeleton, some sort of incident response plan, and then test the plan. That is really, really critical. Um, and again, that even, even above your other policies and procedures, that is the one that needs to be dusted off regularly, needs to be tested regularly. Um, it's not going to do you any good to go, well, yeah, we have a documented incident response plan. It's right there. <laughs> and nobody else knows where it is. Nobody else knows even that they're in it. Like, oh, I've got a role in this. <laughs> yeah. be socialized. It has to be tested um, because you, you want to be able to respond um, as best you possibly can for wherever you are, for whatever team you have, whatever technology you have, you want to be able to respond as best as possible. So those are my three. It's no good Thanks having so. that IR plan in that dusty binder with the cobwebs on it, is it really? So Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so, so Larry, I'd like to ask you for your three actually as well. Well, that, that's that's what I was about to get. So, <laughs> so for me now, right, and so everybody will get right based on how long I've been in this industry and and what I've been doing, how I'm going to tie this those two together, right? So, so one, everything they said is absolutely prudent. But the one thing you have to do with all that is align it to your business. If you are in healthcare, it's going to look different than if you're in financial services, and it's going to look different than if you're in retail, right? So you desperately need to understand how your business makes money, because that's going to help you identify what your critical data is, what systems actually contain your critical data, and actually process it to enable your company to function. Because ultimately, we all want to get paid, right? So, so align everything that they've said to your business. If you don't, and you're doing it in a generic function, you're not going to be building something to a level of specificity to deal with the specific risk that your business faces that are that are nuanced versus risks that other organizations face, right? Because healthcare dealing with PHI and dealing maybe dealing with whether you're a hospital system, whether you're a home healthcare entity, whether you're pharmaceuticals, right? Whether you're insurance, each one of those is going to have a different type of risk that they're dealing with based on the data that they're dealing with, different than a credit union or a bank, right? So, so align to your business is number one for me. Number two is, you know, um, O'Shea talked about collaborating with the business uh, outside of security. So collaborating with IT, collaborating with your business partners. So I'm going to take this one step further. Collaborate with your peers outside of your company. I can tell you in the 29 years I've been in this industry, I've learned more from my peers in the industry, the O'Shea's, the Lens, the CISOs of these different organizations that I interact with on a regular basis than any trainings, any webinar, because it's these collective conversations that I have of what they're doing in their environment that I take back to say, okay, this is how this could potentially apply in my environment. So it becomes this brain trust that I've built over years of being able to lean on all these things I've gotten from other people because I know I'm not the smartest person in the room and I know that other people are experiencing things that I may not be thinking about, right? Or have experiencing things that I may potentially end up having to experience. So collaborate and find a community of peers that you engage with to learn outside of your own space. Because when we get caught up just being in our bubble we limit ourselves and we limit the potential exposure of our learning. And the last piece, and I love to leave it here, and Lynn mentioned it, and O'Shea gave a piece of it earlier, was, was incident response. At the end of the day, Lynn's right, it's not if, it's when. Um, and, and so having a plan is important, but, but I like to use this phrase a lot of one of my favorite fighters. Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so at the end of the day, right, because you know you're going to have an incident, you can't write a plan and wait until you get into the incident to then start walking through the plan. You must test that plan. But it's important that you test that plan, not just at the technical level with the technical teams who are going to operationally respond, but at the executive level. Your CEO needs to know what their role is. The general counsel needs to know what their role is. Who Corporate communication and HR needs to know what their role is. Everybody's got a role. Business leaders need to know what their role is. The entire company needs to understand what is their role because depending on the size of your organization and if you're regulated and what state or what country you're in, you may have news uh, that starts contacting you. Or what if somebody contacts somebody in the marketing department? What does that person know about what they should or shouldn't say? Oh, right? yeah. It's <laughs> all of those types of things that, that your organization needs to be aware of. So when you are practicing these IR plans and you're testing it, which you should be doing at least twice a year, if not more, you need to ensure that you're doing it at every level because everybody in the company is going to have some aspect of understanding that they need to know about what do they do or don't do when you go into an incident response plan. Exactly. So, yeah, we marketing people have a habit of being a bit trigger happy on an old notification email. So, yes, it's definitely worth making sure everyone within the organization is, is properly trained as to what well, to do. Because what I've seen, right, I, I've seen organizations have somebody from the media, a reporter, an investigative reporter, 
And these investigative reporters will kind of contact anyone that'll pick up, any phone that'll pick up, any email that'll respond. And they just start asking questions. Hey, you know, uh, this is such and such. We heard that you guys had a breach. How are you responding to it? And if everybody in the company doesn't know, hey, I am not to talk to news media. We had an incident as an organization. We are working through it. If you get contacted by media, give them this person to talk to. And, and I've watched it where people have been like, oh, oh, yeah, they did. And, you know, uh, uh, the CISO's dealing with it. And, you know, we, we're working through some of the problems. <laughs> and, and they go and write this up. And they yeah. don't put the person's name, but they go and write it. And then it comes out in the paper the next day. And you're like, you know, you're spinning it in the executive leadership table. And everybody's like, who the hell said that? Where did that come from? Like who, right? And you, and you don't know what it come to find out because you didn't communicate holistically to the entire organization. Hey, we're in the middle of an incident, right? You may get contacted by reporters. Please don't say anything. Point them to this person. They're handling all external communication. It's that level of detail uh -huh. that, you, that everyone has to know and you have to think through. So that's why practicing these things, working with an outside organization who's going to come in, do a tabletop, Give, give you different injects and scenarios of things that can happen so that you have to, as an organization, think through all these different things and respond to it. Mm -hmm. Because again, it, you know, getting in the ring as a boxer, right? Yeah, I'm standing, I see Mike Tyson and he's, you know, he's only 5'11", I'm 6'6". Six, six, and, you know, I'm like, okay, I probably got to reach on him so I can keep him at a distance. But he step inside my reach and give me an uppercut, I'm a be thinking really different about how I'm going to have to deal with this. There you go. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for, for joining us today, panelists and attendees alike. Um, we will be sharing the replay link um, after the webinar. So keep your eyes peeled tomorrow. Hopefully we'll have it out to you by then. Um, if you um, if you missed today's webinar, then uh, you will receive it. Um, but if you have any other colleagues um, that you feel that would benefit from it, please do send it on. Um, and if you do have any questions that arise after the webinar, please do send them through to communications at cyberclan.com and we'll try and answer them for you. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to our wonderful panellists, Larry, O'Shea and Lynn. Um, and yeah, we'll call this the end. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks O'Shea. Thanks, Lynn. See you all later. Later. Okay.